I was one of those kids that really, really wanted a Sega Saturn. I really wanted the Sega CD. I wanted the new stuff that my best friend Connor had at the time, but alas, I never got those consoles. I was Sega-less for a while. At least I had the N64 and the PlayStation 1, but when the Sega Dreamcast came out, hot damn, I was there. First in line at Costco. I bought a combo pack with Sonic Adventure, controllers, and VMUs and everything. I was ready to dream. I was ready to cast. I was... The console did none of those things, but... At least it felt like it did. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another Top 10. September 9th, 1999 marks the birthday of the Dreamcast. While it recently passed, I really feel that the Dreamcast is one of the most underrated consoles of all time. It's one that I really hold near and dear to me, and I have a ton of memories playing the Dreamcast, especially with the VMU, the little memory card that you would store your chows on and play with friends all over the world. Honestly, it's a device that I really wish got more love and up until, I don't know, less than 10 years ago was even supported fully by Sega. So today, I thought, let's take a look at my favorite top 10 games on the Sega Dreamcast. Today's episode will be a celebration of Sega's last major console, and its heyday occurred during a time when I was creating truly strong bonds with games in my formative years that held and continue to resonate with me up until today. This list will be solely focused on my top 10 favorite games from the Dreamcast era. Please understand that I by no means expect anyone to share my list or accept it by anything other than just opinion. Many if not all these games have connected with me for totally random and weird reasons. So just for sake of it, I'd love to hear your thoughts about your Dreamcast top 10 games in the comments below. I've always been a huge wrestling fan. When I was little, even more so. I would wait with bated breath for the next local wrestling show in my town when The Rock was all the rage. He was my absolute hero. He still is. I had to see him in action whenever I could. In the doldrums of my life between shows, WWF Royal Rumble was my fix to tide me over until then, and I couldn't get enough. Looking back at it, I'm gonna say it definitely was a bit of a guilty pleasure, you might say. Sure, it was a very low poly game and many critics poo pooed it, but it was an arcade wrestling game. It gave me a chance to see The Rock, to play as The Rock, and most importantly, to dominate as The Rock. What more could a kid ask for? I guess maybe for The Rock to raise me as his own and teach me the true ways to being an ultimate wrestling champion, eventually becoming the highest paid actor in recent years, who is also technically now a YouTuber. Hey, Dwayne, you want to collab? We can start our own tag team duo, The Rock and Complete Collection. If you smell what The Rock is completing. Look, I have weird aspirations. I have weird dreams. Number nine. Soul Calibur has spurred many sequels, but as of late, it's kind of fallen from grace. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was cool playing as Link, Heihachi, and Spawn in Soul Calibur 2. Playing as Yoda, Darth Vader, and Starkiller in Soul Calibur 4 was really rad, and Ezio appearing in Soul Calibur 5 was not too bad. But in my opinion, as the series has evolved, it tended to take a few steps forward, and then instead of stepping back, they kind of just sidestepped like you would in Soul Calibur. Nonetheless, I'll never forget the original. I poured so many hours into Soul Calibur when I was little. I know that there was Soul Blade or Soul Edge or whatever, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the original Soul Calibur on the Dreamcast. The more I played, the better I got. The better I got, the more I could advance the new challenges, eventually unlocking more modes or characters. And I would just keep getting better and better to the point where I felt my increased growth and prowess. That empowerment was sweet euphoria for my younger self. And because of that, it easily earned its place on this list, as well as a cherished childhood memory. Games that challenge you and motivate you and reward your hard work and time is essentially what drives me to my day-to-day -day career here at The Completionist. All this considered, another big draw of the game was the selection of crazy-ass characters I had at my disposal, like Nightmare and Tekken's Yoshimitsu. Did somebody say Yoshi? No, Yoshimitsu, Bradley. Yoshimitsu. God, we gotta stop. We gotta just work on getting you off the Yoshi brand. Let's just, how about just Bradley? And give yourself like a little, a little like sitcom intro. I'd be down for that. Number eight. Okay. 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 
Okay, okay. Hear me out. Sonic Adventure. Hey, everyone, just calm down. Take a seat. Take a seat. Sonic Adventure. Let me finish. Shut it, Steven. I love this game. This is my list. There's the door. You read the disclaimer. Sonic Adventure was the first game I ever owned on the Dreamcast, and yes, it has its flaws, but it is insanely fun, which is definitely the most important part of any game, and all of its flaws make it that much more endearing for me. While everyone has their 100 things wrong with Sonic videos and lists, I prefer to say this. Sure, you can have those opinions and views, and I'm happy that you do, but I think Sonic Adventure deserves some credit for succeeding in changing up the formula of what came before it. I think it successfully made the jump from 2D to 3D. Albeit there were some painful moments along the way, but there are also many moments in Sonic Adventure where it honors the 2D quite well. The game feels like it's making a stand and making Sonic belong more in a 3D environment, and this game set that standard. Aside from its troublesome camera, weird dialogue syncs, and big the f***ing cat, this game is fun, and my love for Crush 40 came from this game. One day, I'll see them perform. One day. For a launch title, Sonic Adventure feels like it had a lot of game to it. It feels like that good friend that makes you laugh and is always a good time. He or she isn't perfect and that's okay, they're my friend and that's all that matters. As I replayed it on Beard Bros recently, I rediscovered my love for its silly ridiculousness and ever amusing nature. The one thing I could say against it with a clear conscience is holy sh**. I still think this from before, Big the Cat, your character and level designs are utterly tragic. Thank God they were short. I am so confused that anyone would ever think that Big the Cat was cool. Look at those rubber weird human hand gloves. Look, I know everyone's all divisive on stuff, but can we all agree, kind of as a unit, that Big the Cat is not good? It's like not a part of the game, it's just like a side thing. Big the Cat's the DLC of Sonic Adventure. Not even Defendant could save you, Big. I'm not wearing a suit for you, you piece of shit cat. Number seven. This next game is visceral, action-packed, and undoubtedly the king of the rail shooter genre. Ladies and gentlemen, dogs of the AMS, I present to you the House of the Dead. Two. I don't know why he said the House of the Dead so weird and didn't say two, because you kind of expect him to in the title, but he should just say it. House of the Dead 2 had me on the edge of my seat the entire time. No breaks, no stopping, just constant zombie murder action. But also the fact that this was one of the only games my dad didn't refuse to play with me. It set it apart from the rest. My dad hates video games, let alone holding controllers. But the Dreamcast had third-party peripheral light guns, and they were sick. This was the only game we both shared an interest in, and I would not take that lightly. We'd sit together and play it and laugh and just plain all have a good time together. Especially during a scary time in our lives when he underwent a quadruple bypass heart surgery. And while he was recovering, we both sat there and played this game nonstop. For a man who despises video games, something about House of the Dead 2 struck a chord with him. And it gave me a chance to connect with him in a way I had never before. And I would never give that up. Plus, the voice acting in this game is god-awful. Woo-wee! It is so bad, it's good. At last, you've come. Friends, the door of fate shall open. Number six. Makes great story, ramped up graphics, complimentary conflict, and the blend thereof, and you get Resident Evil way better than its predecessors. In Resident Evil Code Veronica, the camera improvements alone sold the game for me. Funny enough, I actually remember as a kid trying to buy Code Veronica from a KB Toys with my own personal birthday money. The clerk was very stern on not allowing this transaction to happen because I was too young. However, to young Gerard, this was only a minor setback. All I had to do was give the money to my mom and ask her to buy it for me, and she did! Ha! Take that, KB Toys and the ESRB and anyone else who's stopping me from playing games! That's what I would have said if I was... If that was me today. Although the ironic thing is that I always got a pleasure out of not selling Call of Duty to kids when I worked at Best Buy. I got this weird high of telling a 12 year old kid that no, you can't have modern warfare. Go get your mom so I can tell her why it's bad for you. Anyways, my mom had much less concerns if it was appropriate for me and boy am I glad that she didn't give a Code Veronica at the time was my favorite entry of Resident Evil. I actually recently completed this game earlier this year, so if you want a full-on in-depth breakdown of why I love it so much, you can check that out in the description down below. Number five. 
A lot of my coworkers speak very, very highly of the second game, and so I've heard it is objectively superior, but unfortunately, I never played it, so I can't have that opinion. I can only attest to my love of Power Stone 1. It's a blast and a half. If you've never heard of it, it's basically Smash Brothers meets Poi Poi, except you can only play one-on-one. -on -one. And if you're one of the few people out there that owns a Vita or a PSP, you can buy it and play it. With all the features of battle, the possibility of pulling off something completely bananas is super likely at any given moment. The levels are dynamic with terrain variations, obstacles, buffs, and throwable furniture. During the battles, various colored gems, or power stones if you will, will appear. And if you collect three different ones, you'll basically go Super Saiyan. I'm truly sad that this series never caught on or became super popular because it has so much potential in my eyes. By the way, video aside, uh, if any of you have an extra copy of Power Stone 2, I am looking for it. Uh, I could take it off your hands. I'll trade you in some game codes. This is not a bit. I am actually looking for a copy of Power Stone 1 and 2. Seriously, it is not a bit. Preferably with manual and CD. Let me know. Please. I'll sign something. I'll, I'll, I'll buy a game for you. We'll make a trade. We'll make it work. Number four. I really don't have nostalgia tinted lenses for Jet Set Radio, and I was still not let down when I played this hit two years ago on the show. For a full rundown of that game, check out the video right here in the description down below. Jet Set Radio encompasses several wacky things that somehow make for one of the best gaming experiences on a console. Kick-ass soundtrack, weird-ass gameplay, badass stunts. One thing this game doesn't do is make you feel like a jackass. The game is very bizarre, yes, but aesthetically, everything comes together and it does it very well. It baffles me to this day that cell shading captivates me and enhances any game or narrative it's utilized in. It's become its own style of graphic that never disappoints. What's not to like about this game? It's got graffiti, it's got fat beats, smooth rhythm, beautiful pacing throughout it. Plus, you even get a generous dusting of nightmare fuel. Let me try and update the kids for 2017. It's essentially Splatoon on magnet skates, except graffiti. And, you know, not a post-apocalyptic seafood world. Number three. Now this is what a Marvel vs. Capcom game should look like. Now this is what a Marvel vs. Capcom game should sound like. Now this is Marvel vs. Capcom 2, Volume 5. I've been a fan of the Versus series for quite a while, but it wasn't until Marvel vs. Capcom 2 for the Dreamcast that I was fully invested. Booting up this game again, I was immediately swept back into my childhood. Sitting on the character select screen and hearing, I wanna take you for a ride. And just looking at the massive roster made me remember all of the incredible times I had with this game. Every character looks like it was ripped right out from their video game selves or comic books they originally appeared in. Just look at Mega Man's face when he's kicking major ass. And the music, oh my god, the music! All on one disc for a low, low pro- Okay, you guys get the point. Every song in the game has a jazzy feel that keeps the fights feeling both light and energetic. The soundtrack not only works while I'm beating down Sabretooth, but also when I'm waking up, driving my car, grocery shopping, or beating down Captain Commando. The combat transitioned away from 2v2 to 3v3, which makes the variety of teams you could create nearly infinite. See what I did there? Marvel's Capcom Infinite, none of you guys bought it. All right, all right, fine, it makes sense. Just saying it right now, kind of my disappointment of the year. Yes, you can create classic teams like Ryu, Wolverine, and Spider-Man, but you could also go nuts and make a team that consists of BB Hood, Omega Red, and Amingo. You remember Amingo, right? The half plant, half man, half dancing cactus looking thing? He may not be playable in a game after this, but I will always remember having those memories of picking up my opponents devouring them, and then dancing the night away. I love this game so much, I have an arcade cabinet of it. It's sick, it's tight. And that's all I got to say. Number two. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Dreamcast was definitely the straight from arcade to your home machine. And one of my absolute favorites that worked on console as well as it did in the arcade is Crazy Taxi. No other game lives up to its name as much as this one. You drive a taxi and it's always crazy, simple as that. 
and your passengers yell at you constantly, more so if you don't get to their destination on time, and surprisingly less if you're taking a quick detour underwater. Isn't that crazy? And I know for a fact that I am not the only one who immediately thinks of the hit song All I Want by The Offspring. That song is basically Crazy Taxi's soundtrack, as far as I'm concerned. And if you thought Alex was the only one who loved hitbox porn, you'd be wrong. These passengers tip out the wazoo if you narrowly evade collisions and make crazy maneuvers as much as possible. If you really think about this game and the idea of it overall, how did it make it off the cutting room floor? Acclaim Entertainment made it happen against all odds, complete with super high stakes and nail-biting tight time limits to the point where you need to memorize the entire map of the game if you just want to pass. You know, perhaps I could make a killer clone game called, uh, Insane Bus. Starring me, Bus Driver. I have a badge and everything. I'll take you to and from school. Number one! If you've been watching my channel since its inception, you'd know that this game is my number one. And while I already had the first game in the series on this list already, I want to quantify both these games as very different from one another. Sonic Adventure 2, in my opinion, is my favorite Dreamcast game of all time. I loved the crap out of this game. Me and my friend Chris Matsumoto bought the game and played it all the way through to completion in one sitting, staying up beyond our bedtimes. This game was one of those games that made me feel like a completionist, and that's because the game is huge. Adventure 2 nixes the overworld hub from Sonic Adventure 1 which I think is brilliant. It limits the gameplay to three different styles with tons of different story crossover. It got rid of Big the Cat, kind of, and they introduced Shadow the Hedgehog, which at the time was huge. An evil version of Sonic that wasn't robotic? Shadow did evil things, and the public blamed Sonic thinking that Shadow was him. You can play as both the heroes or the villains. The Chows got a more fleshed out situation in regards to raising them. And the replayability in this game is through the roof. Plus, the soundtrack is killer. Nostalgia glasses and all, as far as I'm concerned, I have the deepest, most fondest of memories with Sonic Adventure 2. I know that everyone out there makes tons of jokes about Sonic, me included, but I truly love almost every single one of the Sonic games. Except like three of them, 06, Boom, and the Storybook series. And yes, I know those are two different games, but I consider them one. Sonic Adventure 2 not only is my favorite 3D Sonic game, but it's the last 3D Sonic game in which I remember Sonic at his pinnacle form, which is why it's number one on my favorite Dreamcast games of all time. That's it, that's all. Those are my top 10 Sega Dreamcast games of all time. I know it's a weird list. I know a lot of you hate me because it's not the same list as yours, but the beauty of this is that you can tell me what your top 10 are in the comments below, or let me know on Twitter. Tell you what, if you're paying attention, just send me a picture of your favorite game, just the box art, no words, just that, same exact thing. If you missed last week's video, you know what, screw that. If you missed Defend It, our show that we brought back, you can give it a click right here. And if you're new here, click that subscribe button and like, and let me know other top 10s you want to see next. That's it, that's all, and we'll see you this Friday for another episode of The Completionist. See you later.